Hello, friends, and welcome to another Bible study here at JMS, JMBC. We are so happy that you joined us. Before we begin, let us pray. Father, we come acknowledging that you are God Almighty and that we can do nothing without you. We humbly ask now, Lord, that you will speak to us through, the, through your word by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. Give us ears to hear, hearts that are open to his leading, and minds that are willing to submit to your will. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our theme this year at JMBC is Citizens Preparing Mind, Body, and Spirit for Post-Pandemic Living. Our main emphasis is Kingdom Citizens Learning How to Walk by Faith, Abraham's Journey. The thought for the month, the dictionary defines faith as complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Our study of the, of the life of Abram and eventually Abraham shows us what it means to walk by faith. To be a person of faith carries a lot of weight and a lifetime of trust. Our key words are trust, encourage, faith, and promise. This is lesson 21 the renaming of Abram and Sarai. Our questions to consider. Number one, in Christians, we, we see that God changed the names of several people. If God were to change your name and give you a new name based on your character, thoughts, and deeds, what would that name be? Now, notably, uh, in Scripture, we see Abram and Sarai that we are studying today, their grandson, Jacob's name, was changed to Israel. In the New Testament, Simon was changed to Peter. Now, when God changed names, he did it to instill a new vision for that person's life or a new role he wanted them to play. In Scripture, we, uh, people in Christ, are collectively called by any number of names, a treasure, chosen, his handiwork, his beloved, saints, sons of God, no longer a slave, but free. Personally, if God were to change my name, it would have to, it would have to be something that means she's a work in progress. I'm not done with her yet. Thank God I'm, I'm not what I used to be, but I, I am a new creation in Christ. Number two, what, why was it so important for the slave master in the movie Roots to change and have Kunta Kente to accept the given name Toby? So almost everyone of a certain age, probably close to mine, are familiar with uh, Roots, the television adaptation of Alex Haley's epic novel back in the 1970s. And according to the History Channel, Kunta Kente was... Um, of the Mandinka people of Gambia, Gambia. He was a warrior who was educated, clever, skilled, strong, resilient, proud, a young man of immense courage and spiritual fortitudes, all traits that empowered him. And then he is captured and enslaved. And one of the most painful scenes in that uh, drama is when the slave owner has him whipped until he accepts the name Toby. And as you're watching that, your spirit is, is raging. My name is not Toby. My name is not Toby. The most important anchor to our self-identity, arguably, is our name. And if the world can rename you or assimilate you into their practices, you would have been stripped of what is arguably the most important part of your identity. And if you are robbed of your identity, it's easier for, easier for one who would oppress you to deny your humanity. Nowadays, it's more subtle, of course. If you are labeled scary or a menace or threatening, it, it appears now to give people the right to shoot first and act questions later, even with our little children. Number three, do you know the significance of your name or nickname, and why were you given that name? What things do 
your name or nickname reflect about you? Truthfully, I have not thought about my name a lot in life. <laughs> it was my name, <laughs> the name that was given to me. Now, from what I understand, my name is Maxine. My mother enjoyed listening to the radio as we were growing up as children. There was a women's group called the Andrews Sisters. She loved the Andrews Sisters. And one of their names was Maxine. And I am pretty sure that that's where my name came from. My last name, by the way, is Isaac. My maiden name is Isaac, which, as we are learning um, in the book of uh, Genesis about um, Abram, his son, his son's name was Isaac, meaning laughter. Now, my family called me Mackie, which apparently was a, a combination of my name and my father's name. My father's name was Matthew, and people called him Mac. And when I came along, they kind of added our names together to create Mackie. My, my college friends and my sorority sisters called me Max. Um, and my mother called me Sugar Darling, which I still love. <laughs> now, what I, what I um, learned as I was preparing for this lesson is that there will come a time when Jesus will give all of us a name. In Revelation 2.17, it says, to the one who is victorious, I will give some hidden manner. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. I'm looking forward to that name. And I, I, I'm betting it's going to be something like Sugar Doll. <laughs> Our text for this lesson comes from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 15. I'm not going to read all through that uh, text. It's kind of long, but I, I hope as we go through this that you have your Bibles or your devices open as we go through the lesson. The heart of the lesson says, A new name given, a promise renewed, and a covenant established. Our introduction in Genesis 17, 1 to 15, God reaffirms his promise to give Abraham a son and make him the father of many nations. And to mark this occasion, uh, God gives Abram and Sarai new names and promise to bless Ishmael. Okay, number, our um, first Section, kingdom citizens need to know who God is and what he requires of them. Now, as we go through um, the lesson today, we're going to um, see in some places how God interacts with Abram and how, in and how Abram interacts with God. And I think we're going to learn a lot about what it means to worship. And we're also going to see how God reveals himself. To people. Now, in um, here we're said we're, t we're told God is omni, meaning all. God is omnipotent, all powerful, omniscient, all knowing, omnibenevolent, always good. And then it says God is self sufficient. The term which which defines God's self sufficiency is. Asiety, we talked about this a few weeks ago, A-S-E-I-T-Y. He has everything. He doesn't need anything or anyone. Without, without, he is completely God without any help. And without God, we are nothing. But God doesn't really need us for anything. Now, as we study Abraham, it's important for us to remember that we have a Bible or our devices or whatever in front of us. Abraham did not have that. He had God's spoken word and God came to him in visions or dreams or, or in visitations. So let us, um, and then, then the other part of Abraham as we're studying his faith is that there were long periods of time between his interactions with God and 
we should we should wonder how we would react if for 13 years or 25 years we heard nothing from God. Now we can we can open our Bibles if we are struggling with some issue or have questions about something, we can open his word and try to find some direction. Abraham did not have that. And I think um, as we put that into the context of our study, it helps us understand how dramatic maybe his faith was. Um, so, so God called Abraham back in Genesis 12, 4, Relative to where we are studying today in Genesis 17, that was 25 years ago. When he said to, he, when he said to Abraham, leave your home, go out. Abraham, Abraham was at that time 75 years old. As a, relative to today's lesson, it was 13 years since the birth of Ishmael. Since God, since God has spoken to Abram, Abraham. So now let us look at this verse in, in uh, Genesis 17, verse 1. I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and blameless. It states who God is and how he reveals himself in this instance and also what he requires. I am almighty God, El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. So we see um, through studying the various chapters of Genesis as we've been following over the last several weeks with the, Abram's journey. For example, when he comes back from saving Lot and his family, he gets he's a little bit concerned because he has created some enemies now and the other thing about that is on his way home he meets the king of Sodom and the king of Sodom the king of Sodom wanted the the people but told Abram that he could keep all of the booty the bounty right and Abraham said i don't want it i have sworn an oath to the lord God most high, creator of heaven and earth, Elohim, tells us something about Abraham. And, and while, while um, just coming back from that journey, in, in chapter 15, verse, verse 1, when Abraham is feeling a little forlorn, wondering about what's going to happen now. Genesis 15, 1 says, the word of the Lord came to Abraham saying, Don't, Abraham, I am thy shield and very great reward. So God, God at the time when Abraham was in need of reassurance, God reveals himself as the person that Abraham needs at that moment. And they start to have this interaction. Um, and in, 15, in Genesis 15, 1, Abraham, he's whining a little bit about, you know, what, what are you going to give me? I don't have a child. But he, he addresses God as sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And, and the one who will, who will inherit my estate is Eleazar. And God took him outside. Say, Abraham, look at the stars. To me, that demonstrates the omnibenevolence of God. When Abraham is wondering about his future and all of that, God takes him out and gives him hope. Look at the stars. You are going to have more descendants than the stars if you can even count them. So in our lesson today, the Lord appeared to Abraham, whispering in Abraham's heart by reason of God's delay in fulfilling his word. And after all of those years, remember, now, by now, Abraham is 99. His hope is failing. 
His strength is failing. He's an old man. And God says, I am almighty God. Wherever and whenever there are storms in our lives, we can hide in him. He is our shelter in the storm. He gives us peace beyond understanding. Even when circumstances are chaotic and we don't understand, he is our shelter, our shield, and our very great reward. When we put our faith and trust in him, God speaks to us, confirming that he is trustworthy and faithful. So why did he wait for 99 years with Abraham being 99 and Sarah being barren so that there could be no doubt that the promise required the intervention and supernatural intervention of God himself. It reminded me of the, 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 the episode with Lazarus. Now, he could have gone you know, to, to restore Lazarus's life before four days, but he waited until there could be no doubt that the miracle laid in his power and his supernatural ability. God himself, it was for his glory. And, and what he's showing, about to show Abraham now is that the benefit of the covenant rests solely in his power and his grace. Walk before me, he said, which means in front of me, in the presence of, in the face of, as if the, the eyes of the Lord are on you because they are. He is omnipresent. He's always there. David in Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. And then he says, walk before me blameless. Thank God, blameless does not mean sinless. All have sinned. The, the word blameless comes from the Hebrew word tamin, literally meaning complete, sound, whole. God wanted all of Abraham, a total commitment. The Benson Commentary say, says this about that. To walk before God is to set him always before us and to think and speak and act in everything as though always under his eyes. It is to have a constant regard to his word as our rule and to his glory as our end and in all our actions. It is to be spiritual in all our duties and religious worship and wholly devoted to him in holy conversations. We must remember that this upright walking with God is the condition of his all-sufficiency. If we neglect him, we forfeit the benefit of our relationship with him. Point number two. Kingdom citizens know that sometimes permanent changes must occur in their lives before they can enter into covenant relationship with God. After God had related his part of the covenant, he proceeded to outline Abram's part of the covenant. As for you, this is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between you and me. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male will be cut off. He has broken the covenant. Now, the, the sign of the covenant is, a, is an important uh, word because 
as the as the new church in uh, in the book of Acts develops, this this issue of circumcision becomes um, a problem, and Paul has to spend a lot of time reanalyzing, if you will, that circumcision is not a requirement to be saved. It is a sign of the covenant, just as the rainbow is a sign of the Noahic covenant. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are signs of people who are in the new covenant, a sign of the covenant. Now, since the covenant promises of the Abrahamic covenant dealt with offspring, the text says God put the mark of his covenant in Abraham's reproductive organs, just as the covenant, God's covenant with Noah included a sign. His covenant with Abraham and his offspring included a sign. Point number three. Kingdom citizens must know how to conduct themselves in the presence of God. God said to Abraham, as far as Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and, sh and will surely give you a son by her so that she will be the mother of nations. So God changes Abram's name to, from, to Abraham, meaning father of nations, Abraham means exalted father. Abraham means the father of a multitude. Similarly, Sarai means princess. Sarah means the mother of nations or the princess of a multitude. I will bless her and will surely give you a son. Verse 15 and 16 says, with another affirmation from God, Abraham fell face down and laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? He said to God, and then he said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Now, it's important for us to understand that because the word says Abraham laughed. He was not laughing because he doubted. It was as if he was saying, you mean an old geezer like me is going to have a child? <laughs> and that's, that, that's what the laughter was about because we are told in scripture in uh, Romans 4, 19 to 20, Paul says, without weakening his faith, he faced the fact. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave God glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. So in response to Abraham's question regarding Sarah, God said, your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him, the, the benevolence of God. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by the, this time next year. God's covenant, God's promise to bless the nations through Abraham was to be fulfilled through Isaac's line from whom Jesus is descended. And Abraham's mention of Ishmael should remind us that we should always be concerned and pray and provide for all of our children, whether they come to us through legitimate or illegitimate partners adoption, foster care, or stepchildren, they are all ours. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your holy word, which allows us to see your plan of redemption evolve through your servant Abraham. 
May we, like him, not waver in our beliefs regarding your promise and your power. But even in times when life circumstances toss us to and fro, we remain steadfast and strengthened in our faith, being fully persuaded that you will do everything you promise, and your grace is made perfect in our weakness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.